There is but one thing in the world that gives a man real and enduring power, and that is character. Reputation, bear in mind, is not character. Reputation is that which people are believed to be. Character is that which people are. If you would be a person of great influence, then be a person of real character. Character is the philosopher's lodestone through which all who have it may turn the base metals of their life into pure gold. Without character you have nothing, you are nothing, and you can be nothing, except a pile of flesh and bone and hair worth perhaps twenty-five dollars. Character is something that you cannot beg or steal or buy. You can get it only by building it, and you can build it by your own thoughts and deeds, and in no other way. Through the aid of auto-suggestion, any person can build a sound character, no matter what his past has been. As a fitting close for this lesson, I wish to emphasize the fact that all who have character have enthusiasm and personality sufficient to draw to them others who have character. You will now be instructed as to how you shall proceed in developing enthusiasm in the event that you do not already possess this rare quality. The instructions will be simple, but you will be unfortunate if you discount their value on that account. First, complete the remaining lessons of this course because other important instructions which are to be coordinated with this one will be found in subsequent lessons. Second, if you have not already done so, write out your definite chief aim in clear, simple language, and follow this by writing out the plan through which you intend to transform your aim into reality. Third, read over the description of your definite chief aim each night, just before retiring, and as you read, see yourself in your imagination in full possession of the object of your aim. Do this with full faith in your ability to transform your definite chief aim into reality. Read aloud with all the enthusiasm at your command, emphasizing every word. Repeat this reading until the small, still voice within you tells you that your purpose will be realized. Sometimes you will feel the effects of this voice from within the first time you read your definite chief aim, while at other times you may have to read it a dozen or fifty times before the assurance comes, but do not stop until you feel it. If you prefer to do so, you may read your definite chief aim as a prayer. The remainder of this lesson is for the person who has not yet learned the power of faith and who knows little or nothing of the principle of auto-suggestion. To all who are in this class, I would recommend the reading of the seventh and eighth verses of the seventh chapter and the twentieth verse of the seventeenth chapter of St. Matthew. One of the greatest powers for good upon the face of this earth is faith. To this marvelous power may be traced miracles of the most astounding nature. It offers peace on earth to all who embrace it. Faith involves a principle that is so far-reaching in its effect that no man can say what are its limitations or if it has limitations. Write into the description of your definite chief aim a statement of the qualities that you intend to develop in yourself and the station in life that you intend to attain and have faith as you read this description each night that you can transform this purpose into reality. Surely you cannot miss the suggestion contained in this lesson. To become successful you must be a person of action. Merely to know is not sufficient. It is necessary both to know and do. Enthusiasm is the mainspring of the mind which urges one to put knowledge into action. Billy Sunday is the most successful evangelist this country has ever known. For the purpose of studying his technique and checking up on his psychological methods, the author of this course went through three campaigns with Reverend Sunday. His success is based very largely upon one word, enthusiasm. By making effective use of the law of suggestion, Billy Sunday conveys his own spirit of enthusiasm to the minds of his followers and they become influenced by it. He sells his sermons by the use of exactly the same sort of strategy employed by many master salesmen. Enthusiasm is as essential to a salesman as water is to a duck. All successful sales managers understand the psychology of enthusiasm and make use of it, in various ways, as a practical means of helping their men produce more sales. Practically all sales organizations have get-together meetings at stated times for the purpose of revitalizing the minds of all members of the sales force and injecting the spirit of enthusiasm, which can be best done en masse through group psychology. 
Sales meetings might properly be called revival meetings because their purpose is to revive interest and arouse enthusiasm, which will enable the salesman to take up the fight with renewed ambition and energy. During his administration as sales manager of the National Cash Register Company, Hugh Chalmers, who later became famous in the motor car industry, faced a most embarrassing situation which threatened to wipe out his position as well as that of thousands of salesmen under his direction. The company was in financial difficulty. This fact had become known to the salesmen in the field, and the effect of it was to cause them to lose their enthusiasm. Sales began to dwindle until finally the conditions became so alarming that a general meeting of the sales organization was called to be held at the company's plant in Dayton, Ohio. Salesmen were called in from all over the country. Mr. Chalmers presided over the meeting. He began by calling on several of his best salesmen to get on their feet and tell what was wrong out in the field that orders had fallen off. One by one they got up, as called, and each man had a most terrible tale of grief to unfold. Business conditions were bad, money was scarce, people were holding off buying until after presidential election, etc. As the fifth man began to enumerate the difficulties which had kept him from making his usual quota of sales, Mr. Chalmers jumped up on top of a table, held up his hands for silence, and said, Stop! I order this convention to come to a close for ten minutes while I get my shoes shined. Then, turning to a small colored boy who sat nearby, he ordered the boy to bring his shoe shine outfit and shine his shoes right where he stood on top of the table. The salesmen in the audience were astounded. Some of them thought that Mr. Chalmers had suddenly lost his mind. They began to whisper among themselves. Meanwhile, the little colored boy shined first one, and then the other shoe, taking plenty of time and doing a first-class job. After the job was finished, Mr. Chalmers handed the boy a dime, then went ahead with his speech. I want each of you, he said, to take a good look at this little colored boy. He has the concession for shoe shining throughout our plant and offices. His predecessor was a white boy, considerably older than himself, and despite the fact that the company subsidized him with a salary of five dollars a week, he could not make a living in this plant, where thousands of people are employed. This little colored boy not only makes a good living without any subsidy from the company, but he is actually saving money out of his earnings each week, working under the same conditions, in the same plant, for the same people. Now, I wish to ask you a question. Whose fault was it that the white boy did not get more business? Was it his fault or the fault of his buyers? In a mighty roar from the crowd, the answer came back. It was the boy's fault, of course. Just so, replied Chalmers. And now I want to tell you this, that you are selling cash registers in the same territory to the same people, with exactly the same business conditions that existed a year ago, yet you are not producing the business that you were then. Now whose fault is that? Is it yours or the buyer's? And again the answer came back with a roar, It is our fault, of course. I am glad that you are frank to acknowledge your faults, Chalmers continued. And now I wish to tell you what your trouble is. You have heard rumors about this company being in financial trouble, and that has killed off your enthusiasm so that you are not making the effort that you formerly made. If you will go back into your territories with a definite promise to send in five orders each during the next thirty days, this company will no longer be in financial difficulty. For that additional business will see us clear. Will you do it? They said they would, and they did. That incident has gone down in the history of the National Cash Register Company under the name of Hugh Chalmers's Million Dollar Shoeshine. For it is said that this turned the tide in the company's affairs and was worth millions of dollars. If you think your lot in life has been hard, read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington, and you may see how fortunate you have been. Enthusiasm knows no defeat. The sales manager who knows how to send out an army of enthusiastic salespeople may set his own price on his services, and what is more important even than this, he can increase the earning capacity of every person under his direction. Thus, his enthusiasm benefits not only himself, but perhaps hundreds of others. Enthusiasm is never a matter of chance. There are certain stimuli which produce enthusiasm, the most important of these being as follows. 1. 
occupation in work which one loves best. Two, environment where one comes in contact with others who are enthusiastic and optimistic. Three, financial success. Four, complete mastery and application in one's daily work of the fifteen laws of success. Five, good health. Six, knowledge that one has served others in some helpful manner. Seven, good clothes appropriate to the needs of one's occupation. All of these seven sources of stimuli are self-explanatory with the exception of the last. The psychology of clothes is understood by very few people, and for this reason it will be here explained in detail. Clothes constitute the most important part of the embellishment which every person must have in order to feel self-reliant, hopeful, and enthusiastic.